presence. For those who are interested in the Word of God, I invite you to open to the book of Isaiah. And we'll be taking our lessons from some things that Isaiah said about God's holy mountain and going up to God's holy mountain. And when he talks about this, I want us to think about God's holy mountain is the zone. We talk about being in the zone. Well, God's holy mountain is the zone to be in. You want to make sure you are in the zone. I've got to make sure that I'm preaching from the zone. That is, I'm preaching from God's holy mountain. You must listen from God's holy mountain. God is in his holy mountain. And those who are in his holy mountain must keep silent before him. Everyone in his holy mountain must be eager to open your ears and listen to God's word. Look at Isaiah chapter 2. Verse 1, Isaiah says this, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Jerusalem was on a holy mountain. Now, concerning Judah and Jerusalem, he says, now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain." Of the Lord's house, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. Now Jerusalem had been on the top of a particular mountain, but there was going to be a new Jerusalem. Galatians chapter 4 talks about Jerusalem that is below and Jerusalem that is above. Now the word of the Lord is going to go forth from Jerusalem. But he says the Lord's house will be established above on the top of the mountains, exalted above the hills. And all nations shall flow to it. So we're not talking about physical Jerusalem anymore. We're talking about a place to which all nations can flow equally to this mountain. Many people shall come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. To the house of the God of Jacob. Why? He will teach us. He will teach us his ways. And we will walk in his paths. We're going to up to the mountain so that we can be taught by God. Go up to God's mountain. To God's holy mountain. What else happens when you're in God's mountain? You teach, or you hear teaching. You learn God's ways. That is, the ways of God, you begin to learn them for yourself. Not only that, but he says, he'll teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. He's got paths for us to walk in. And he's going to teach us and we're going to walk in them. That's what you do when you go up to the mountain, God's holy mountain, to hear his word taught. Remember Moses went up to Mount Sinai to receive God's law. And the experience of being in the presence of God was such an incredible thing, such an awesome thing, that it affected him tremendously both emotionally and physically. You remember, he came down 
holding the Ten Commandments in his hands, but his face was shining. No, when you go up to God's mountain, you come down a changed person. You cannot be in God's holy mountain and stay the same. No, it never stays the same. When a sinner goes up into God's house, when God, a sinner goes up into God's mountain, he comes down with a different look, a different outlook, a different way of life. His face shines. You remember when Jesus went up on the mountain of transfiguration and there Moses and Elijah appeared with him. The disciples saw the three of them, but Jesus' face shined. And Moses and Elijah kind of faded. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about the fact that Moses had a glow about him. His face was shining, but it was a glory that was fading away. But as, it was in, as he was affected by it, he had to put a veil over his face. And he says, that's kind of like it is with hearts. There are some hearts that are ready for God and are ready for God's word. And then there are some who have a veil on their heart so that they can't see. And that's why it's important. Not for us to think that sitting in a building with the name Church of Christ on the front means that we're sitting in God's house. You may be or you may not be. Some of the same people don't necessarily go up to God's mountain while others do. Let us make sure that every single one of us go up to God's mountain. Why? Because there I'm, I'm there to hear God's word. And I'm going to be changed by God's word. Now Isaiah goes on to say, He shall judge between the nations, verse 4, shall rebuke many people. When he rebukes them, they change. And they shall beat their swords, devices that they use for, for, for killing and destroying. People who had a mentality to destroy somebody don't have that, that outlook anymore. He shall judge between the nations and he shall rebuke many people and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, instruments no longer for war. And their spears that they used to, to kill people with, now they use them for pruning hooks to feed people with. Nation shall no longer lift up sword against nation. That is, if you came from a Jewish background and you or and another came from a from a Gentile background, they're not going to be fighting, not on God's mountain. No, we share the mountain now. So spears and swords that we might have formerly used, not here, not in God's mountain. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That's not part of the program in God's mountain. So Isaiah is telling us of a day where we would be able from all nationalities to come up to God's mountain from any direction, from any place on the earth and share something so wonderful together that we won't be fighting one another anymore. That's in God's mountain. Now, Look in chapter 11. He adds a little more information. Hebrews 11 verse 1. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. 
A branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. You know who this is talking about? This is talking about Jesus. Jesus is an offspring of Jesse. The spirit of the Lord rested upon Jesus. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel. Remember, we're going up to God's mountain. We're going to hear what the Lord says. Who are we going to listen to? This this rod from Jesse. This is the one who is going to rebuke us. This is the one who is going to counsel us. Who has great wisdom and understanding. The spirit of the Lord and the fear of the Lord. All are wrapped up in him. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. Talking about Jesus. And he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes. He's not going to look at you and say, oh, you're a Jew. Come on in. You're a Gentile. Get out of here. No, he's not going to judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with a rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins. And faithfulness the belt of his waist. Now listen to the situation when you've got people coming to the rod of Jesse and being rebuked by this wise counselor. What happens is everybody starts to act righteous, do the right thing. What happens is everybody starts to be faithful. And the wolf, the one who would tear up the lamb, is now not going to do that anymore. The the wolf will dwell with the lamb. The leopard that formerly would have eaten up the young goat, destroyed him. The leopard's not going to do that anymore. The calf and the young lion and the fatling, they're all going to be together. And the little child shall lead them. You know what Jesus says? You need to become like little children. The cow and the bear of all things. Enemies. One fearful of the other. The other there to devour and destroy the other one. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. All of that reminds us of the vision of Acts chapter 10, where Peter saw this vision of all these animals came down that were formerly clean and unclean, all mixed together. But now God says, now what's clean and unclean is no longer that way. Don't call it that. And what he was doing is making a comparison with people. People are sometimes mortal enemies. People sometimes behave themselves as enemies. But not when they're in God's house. In God's house you learn the ways of the righteous king. The stem of Jesse. Jesus Christ himself, so that former enemies are now together. They shall not hurt, verse 9, nor destroy, but notice where. They're in the zone. That is, when everybody is in the zone, then we're not enemies. They shall not hurt nor destroy, In all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters covers the sea. Isaiah has described in two verses the vision that God had for his spiritual domain. 
Ephesians chapter 2 describes Gentiles and Jews coming together in one body and there is, being, there is peace because they share something very precious and that's the blood of Jesus Christ. And because of that they have peace in themselves and they have peace between themselves because nothing is more important than that and getting our counsel from Him is tremendous. Flip over to chapter 35. Isaiah 35. Look at verse 8. He adds some more. What formerly was wilderness is now going to really blossom forth. Notice in particular verse 8. He describes something else here. This is a place where you're committed to walking. And as long as you walk there, you're going to be safe. Get off of this highway and the safety is not there. Here is the zone. A highway shall be there. And a road. And it shall be called the highway of holiness. That is everybody who gets on the highway of holiness. Well, the unclean don't pass on the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. But it shall be for others, the people who are not unclean. Whoever walks the road... That is the highway of holiness. He doesn't have to be a a scholar. He doesn't have to be brilliant in this world. He just has to get on the highway of holiness. And so he, although a fool, if he's on this highway, he's he's not going to really go astray. And another thing, lions don't get you on that road. They get you when you get off that road. No lion shall go there. No, not on the highway of holiness. This is the zone. This is the safety zone. Nor shall any ravenous beast go up on it. It shall not be found there. Where will it be found? Off the road. You get off the road, you go into danger. That's why we need to go up to God's holy mountain, brethren. The one that Isaiah is describing here is where there is no danger. Danger is getting off the road. The ransomed of the Lord shall return. Here, when you get on this road, you know what people are doing? They're singing. They come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Why? Because we're on the road to heaven. We're on God's mountain. Now flip over to chapter 60. Chapter 60, verse 17. These closing chapters, Isaiah really bears down on the glories of Of the days of the messianic blessings. And among those great blessings he says. Instead of bronze I will bring gold. Instead of iron I will bring silver. Instead of wood bronze. Instead of stones iron. But notice these next statements. I will also make your officers peace. What's that mean? Well, the officers who, who stand and guard you and who look out for you, your officers are just going, are going to be peace. Peace is what's going to be controlling you and looking after you. And your magistrates, well, that's just going to be righteousness. You're going to be doing the right thing. Violence, oh, No, we don't learn war anymore there. You see, in this zone, in this zone, peace 
are our officers, and righteousness are our magistrates. And violence is no longer heard in your land. Neither washing nor wait or neither wasting nor destruction where? Within your borders. But you shall call your walls, instead of physical Jerusalem had physical walls, you're going to call your walls, say, I'm surrounded by salvation. This is, this is the zone. Your gates, not the physical gates into Jerusalem. No, but your gates, he says, are praise. There's all in the zone, all you can think about is salvation and praise and singing and because you're in the zone, you're thinking and you're you're thinking correctly. Where is this? That's in God's holy mountain. Remember, it is above the hills. It is exalted above the hills. You remember Jesus. When he left the earth, he went out to the Mount of Olives, just outside of Jerusalem, and he ascended above the hills. He ascended above Jerusalem. He ascended above the things on this earth. That's why Paul wrote to the Colossians. He says, now, you put your your thoughts on things above and not on things on the earth. Then Then you're in the zone. There won't be any uncleanness going on in your life. And you won't be hating people. And you won't be mistreating people. And you won't find any need for swords. Why? Because we're in God's zone. And our affections are above, not on things of the earth. And so we put to death, and he lists a bunch of things that we put to death because those things can't be in this zone. Fornication. No, you're not in the zone if you're fornicating. First Corinthians 5, that man at Corinth who had his father, what, what, was he living in the zone? No. And he was in the same church building with some who probably were in the zone, but that man wasn't in the zone. The location does not allow us to think and live For this world, it causes us to think and live as if we are in the presence of God and it is changing us as much as it changed Moses. As much as it changed the 3,000 on the day of Pentecost, as much as it changed Saul, it is the zone. Above the earth. Hebrews 12 says, You haven't come to that fearful mountain, Mount Sinai, where you were afraid to even come near because of the quaking and all of that, all the the, the voice of words that made you shake. No, you haven't come to the mountain that may be touched, he says. But you have come to the mountain. See, the mountain is real. It just doesn't have to be a physical one. The zone where you don't learn fighting, you learn peace. The location, not on things of the earth, but your affections on things above. You see, those who go to the zone, they learn God's ways. 
those who had set their affections on things of the earth, they're never in the zone. Even though, like that man at Corinth, they can sit in the same pew. When you go into God's zone, you learn the way of love. Because God is love. And God is light. And in Him there is no darkness at all. The way of love. Jesus says, you got to be like your Father, even loving your enemies. Because that way you can be like your Father. And, and that's where you're living in the zone, isn't it? The way of love. And John would go on to say, if you hate your brother, you don't love God. And you're not, you've never even been in the zone. You can't be in the zone with God and hate your brother. You go up, you go up to God's mountain and you learn God's ways. You go up to God's mountain and you learn to, to take those swords you used to use to hurt people and you, you, and you learn how to help people. What does not happen when you're in the zone is war. James chapter 4 is trying to get across to us the thing that Isaiah 2 was talking about. Listen to James. He says, where, where, do these, where do wars and fights come from among you? And he's writing, to, he's writing to Christians. Where did this come from? It certainly didn't come from the zone. Do they not come from within your desires for pleasure? That war in your members? You didn't get these desires from God. You got them because you left the zone. That's what he's saying here. You lust and you do not have. You murder and you covet and you cannot obtain. You fight. And they were not necessarily fighting physical wars, but verbal wars and attitude wars. You fight in war and yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Are they living in the zone? And the answer is obvious. So what does not happen when you're living in the zone is you don't fight. And you don't lust for material things and worldly things and selfish things. You, what you desire is God's will above everything else. Not mine, but God's. You don't hurt one another. You don't live in uncleanness like that man at Corinth who had his father's wife. And you don't resort to violence. Why? Because... Living up here with God, living in the zone with God, I don't have time for that. I don't have any interest in that. You see, those who go to God's mountain and determine to live in the zone with God are always thinking, what's God think about me? What's God think about my attitude? What does God think about my behavior? And he's always thinking about your relationship to God. What happens on God's holy mountain? Transformation takes place. Why, your values change tremendously. What used to be important to you is now junk. Like Paul said, I, this used to be important to me. My Jewish credentials, all these things I, that were important to me. When I've, got the, when I've learned the zone, those things are just silly, rubbish. Junk. What happens on God's holy mountain? You learn to love God because you got to know Him. 
The eyes of your understanding saw his beauty and saw his glory. And then you learn to love him with all of your heart, with all of your strength. You can't think of anything else when you're in the zone. But when you're out of the zone, what? You might not think about that. When you're in the zone, you learn to love your neighbor as yourself. That becomes a valuable principle to you because you know it's important to God. And I'm in the zone with God. You learn to love love your neighbor as yourself. Your values change. It's not all about you and your wants. It's all about, well, how can I be helpful? How can I help other people go to heaven? You see, when you go up to God's holy mountain, you learn that your values, what's important to you, changes. It transforms you from the inside out. We learn that all the members, you can't say, I have no need of you. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We learn that everybody that's in the body is important. You don't just flip people off. You say, you're important to the body of Christ. You don't say, I have no need of you. When you're out of the zone, that's what you say. But when you're in the zone, you don't say that. You don't even think that. When you're in the zone, you learn the ways of peace. Ephesians 2 says, because he, the Prince of Peace, has come and he's our great counselor. And we're learning from him that he loves everybody. And he wanted there to be a situation of peace where we could all share this peace with with God and with each other. But when you're in the zone, that's what's important to you. But when you're out of the zone, what? When you're off the mountain, when you get yourself off the mountain, then you don't think about peace anymore. You don't think about getting along like you should and valuing other people like you should. You're off the mountain. Jesus told his disciples, you've got you to gotta be in me. And not only in me, but you've got to abide in me. That is, you've got to stay here. You can't just visit me. I don't want you just visiting me. I want you to abide here. We learn to be like God when we're in the zone. Romans 12 says we don't even think like the world anymore. We don't even think about fitting in with the world anymore. Why? Because we're in the zone where we're thinking about the only thing that's important to me is fitting in with God. The world doesn't know God. But I know God and I want to fit with God. That's what's important. See, your values change. That's when your mind is set. Set on things above and not set on things of the earth. What happens on God's holy mountain? Well, you learn things here. You learn the ways of God here. And you become a transformed people that can no longer see themselves conforming to the world. The attitudes of the world, oh no, we've got different values. They don't know God. But we know God. If we truly have come into the zone. Now brethren. One question remains. Are you living in the zone? See the invitation of God says I don't want you to stay down there. The future is. Of our children, the future of the Lord's church, the strength of the Lord's people is only as strong as those who enter and stay in the zone. Otherwise, you could have a Corinth where some might be in the zone and some are not in the zone. That's no good. That wasn't good at Corinth and it won't be good for us. 
So what we've got to determine is, am I going to listen to God? And I'm going to rise up from where I was. And am I going to go up to God's mountain? Or am I going to stay where I am? And so every one of us got to, got to determine. You're going to stay where you are? Now, do you see yourself as in the zone? Are you in God's mountain learning, being transformed, growing, becoming more like God? Are you out of the zone? Go up. Go up to God's holy mountain and let him teach us his ways. I hope that if you never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning and you understand, hey, I need to get in the zone. I've got to get up God's spiritual mountain, the one that can't be touched, but is very real. I've got to get up there now. And if we can help you, you know the process? Turn your life around, repent, confess your faith in Jesus Christ, be baptized for remission of sins, get in the zone. Then after that, stay in the zone, grow in the zone. That's what's got to happen to every one of us if we want to go to heaven. If you're serious about that and we can help you in any way, you need to make your life right in a public way and we can assist you now. Please come as we stand together and sing this song.